I was trying to be accepted in any crowd. And so I would be connected with people and I would do things that were out that was outside of my character, but I would do it because I wanted to fit in. I would do all these things that everybody else is doing, the same exact thing, but it still wasn't good enough. I still wasn't cool enough. I still didn't fit in. I still was what they would say lame, all these things. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? Like, why is it that I don't fit in? I connected with a young man and we would smoke a lot together and all of that. And then it eventually turned into a relationship and the relationship was not healthy at all in any shape or form eventually it became abusive and I remember just thinking to myself God how did I get into this how did I go from this girl that was with my family and all this this young girl who everyone says was so happy to this girl who's so broken and so shattered and so lost and so insecure immediately in that moment I hear God speak to me and he says I have better for you What's going on, everybody? God bless you. I am excited for you to hear, watch this new testimony. But I did want to let you know about some exciting news. We have partnered with multiple organizations, churches that are ready to help you through whatever you may be going through. Okay, now we've reached 50 million people all over the world, and we have seen time and time and time again in the comment sections the needs. And, uh, and we prayed about this. We asked the Lord to, to guide us and to provide resources. And uh, thankfully, the Lord has answered and we have those resources for you. And so if you are in need of help, if you are in need of a church, if you are in need of community, if you just want to talk to somebody about struggles that you're going through or questions that you have, there will be a link in the comment section down below pinned at the top that you can click. And then it will take you to a form where you can fill out your basic information. And then somebody in your local community will contact you within 48 hours. We're really, really excited about this. So please take advantage of it if you need to. Okay. God bless you and enjoy the new testimony. Growing up in my household, there were six of us total, my two parents and myself and my three siblings. And growing up in our household, we did uh, grow up in church. That was something that was instilled in us from birth because my parents were very strong believers. And so... Um, yeah, we I went to church every we went to church every Sunday. <laughs> um and sometimes I most times I didn't want to go, but it was something that um definitely was required in our home. I have memory of us waking up in the morning at 6 a.m. to have family prayer. And so that was really our life in our household in regards to the faith. Um, we were definitely encouraged to believe in Christ. Now, I understood, you know, going to church and all of that, but I never really understood the concept of having a relationship with Christ. So I wouldn't say that my identity or uh, my belief system was like a firm, like strong in Christ. I just knew that church was the right thing to do. Like I said, we would pray and growing up in our household, I, we were homeschooled up until, well, I was homeschooled up until fourth grade. Just like every family, we had our issues and mostly my parents, they had their issues in regards to their marriage. I didn't fully know everything that was going on. I will say that my parents were really good at keeping, you know, their issues behind closed doors. I do have some memory of some arguments and different things that they walked through. Um, but I never really took it as something that was not normal. That was normal to me. So it, it didn't seem as though it would cause a divorce or anything like that. Um, growing up in my household, there was a moment where I woke up and my mom was crying in my room and I didn't necessarily know why she was crying. I just knew that she was upset and I was pretty young, so I didn't really ask. It was more just, okay, I don't know why mom is upset. Um, but this was around the time where my life definitely changed. What I realized is that, you know, uh, my identity was definitely found in my family because I didn't have that relationship with God or I didn't understand the concept concept of having a relationship with God. My family was my everything. Fast forward to seventh grade. Again, I was homeschooled up until fourth grade, and then I got into school, and, and then I got into uh, middle school, which was seventh grade. I remember sitting in uh, my classroom. At the time, uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I actually had to, excuse me, I had to sit outside of the classroom because they were uh, making something that I was allergic to. And so I remember sitting there doing schoolwork, and I hear 
the intercom and I hear someone from the front office say, tell, reach out to my classroom and say to my teacher, Miss So-and-so, can you please send Brittany Thomas up to the front office? To touch on Brittany, at that time I went by Brittany. So just to fast forward, when I was born, my parents thought I was going to be a boy. I wasn't. And they ended up naming me Brittany legally. But when my father and my mother took me home, my father looked at me and said, her name is not Brittany, her name is Teresa. They never really went through the legal process of changing my name. And so my whole family called me Teresa, but my legal name was Brittany. So that also really kind of messed with my identity because I remember as a child, I didn't even know how to introduce myself. People would ask me what my name was and I would I would be torn whether I would say Teresa or Brittany. And so back to this moment in seventh grade, I'm sitting here and they say, send Brittany Thomas up to the front. I didn't know why I was going up to the front office because again, I didn't, I had no idea what was happening. So I went up to the front office. I see my mom there and I see my younger brother there. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe we have a doctor's appointment. So we get in the car. I look in the trunk and there are bags, black bags full of clothes. So I asked my mom, I say, mom, where are we going? And she said, um, we're just going to go stay with a family friend. And I was like, okay. So I went to sleep. I woke up. We get, we arrived to this place, but I did not recognize these people. They were not familiar to me. Later on, I found, I realized that we were in a woman's shelter. A series of events happened while being in the, this woman's shelter, and we had to move to another woman's shelter. And we were in this shelter for about three months. Now, Teresa, just give us a little bit more insight into what you were feeling, you know, in those moments when you're waking up, you don't know anyone around you, you don't know where you're at, you really have no explanation for what's going on. What were you feeling? What were you going through? I was very confused. Again, my parents, they had their issues, but I didn't I didn't really think it was that bad to where it would cause divorce or to get go to a woman's shelter. I didn't know. And so when I got there, I was confused. I was scared. All I wanted was my dad, but I couldn't talk to him. There were a lot of emotions that I was going through, especially as what, a 12 year old. It was, this was right before my 13th birthday. So a 12 year old, I'm fine. I'm trying to discover myself in middle school, find myself growing into who I am. And so many questions of like, why are we here? Like, I, I knew mom and dad had their moments and had their issues, but why are we here right now? So uh, just a lot of confusion and a lot of questions that I had that I guess later on were answered. But in that moment as a child, it was more of just like, well, I know the main question was, well, are we going to go back? Are we going to, I kept asking my mom, like, are we going to go back to dad? Like, is this just, is this just temporary? Because I have memory of there was another time where we left my dad and we were gone for a certain amount of days and then we went back home. So I was like, well, maybe we're just, mommy's just getting a break and then we're going to go back home. So yeah, that, that, it was just a lot of questions that I had in that moment. Again, there were a series of events that happened. So we ended up going to this other shelter and we were in there for three months. And during this time, my mom did everything that she could to keep us busy and to keep us in counseling, just different things because we were all mourning. Divorce is a death. It really is. And so you're mourning the loss of what you once knew and what, of, of your family. And so I was in gymnastics and my mom tried to keep us in um, extracurricular activities. It was just me and my brother. My older siblings, my two sisters were already out of the house. I remember there was a time while we were at this shelter where all of a sudden I just became so angry. There was so much anger that I felt towards my mom because I still had so many questions of, mom, why did you leave dad? And I remember something switched and I became very disrespectful towards my mom. And the ladies at the shelter were just like, you can't speak to your mother that way and everything. But I just, something switched and it was a lot of anger towards my mom because I blamed her for breaking up our family, not knowing all that she walked through, all that my dad walked through, the challenges that they face in their marriage. But as a kid, the best way to rationalize everything and make sense of everything was, okay, we were fine, then you left and now we're now it's bad. And so, but as a kid, I didn't fully understand the big picture as to why, you know, all of that happened. While being in the shelter, I was still going to my old middle school. And so with that, I would take the bus to my dad's house. And so I have memory of... Um, arriving to the house after school and my dad sitting there looking at pictures of us and just crying. So there were a lot, there was so much pain like in that process that all of us face and we all processed it differently. And I noticed that like over time, like we all process this um, divorce differently. 
But that was very painful for me because growing up, I was always a daddy's girl. And so not being able to be around my dad was a struggle for me as well because I was very close to him. We ended up leaving the shelter. We got a place um, and I ended up going to high school. And thankfully, my freshman year, I was in gymnastics, so I wasn't really so much focused on boys or anything like that. But by my sophomore year, that's when things started shifting. And I started to operate through my pain and through the wounds that I had, not even knowing. And by the age of 16 years old, I gave my virginity. At that point, I was pretty promiscuous through through high school. And I gave my mom a hard time, you know. I was sneaking out the house and just different things that I wasn't supposed to do. But in reality, I was seeking for love. Like, I wanted someone to love me. I wanted someone to accept me. Again, my identity wasn't in Christ. And so I was trying to find things that I can find my identity in. And one of those things were boys. One of the, Another thing was sex. And and that's the things that I was doing in high school. And I would tell, I, used, I tell my mom this now, and I've told her in the past, like, mom, it would have been so great to be able to sit down and have someone like talk to me about the desires that I had. And I didn't really have someone to talk to me about that. It was more like, because we were, we grew up in a Christian home, it was like, you just don't have sex. You wait until you get married. It's the wrong thing to do. Again, because I didn't have a relationship with Christ, that didn't matter to me. I was like, okay, whatever, you know, like I was like, I'm going to do it. This is what I desire to do. But I do wish that I had someone that would tell me like, Teresa, you're worth more, that the right man will wait for you, or just different things, just to really help with my confidence, because I was very, excuse me, very insecure. If a man wanted me or a young boy wanted me at that time, I was like, okay, well, this person loves me. Well, and so I, I really sought after that. And I do wish that I did have someone to tell me otherwise. I was still very, it, I didn't hit my like peak, right? And so meaning in high school, I was still in my mom's house. So there was a limit to things that I could do. I didn't really get into the party scene or anything like that in high school, like my peers were. But um, by the time I graduated high school, and got into college, that's when things went south. And so my freshman year of college, I moved in with a roommate and I was always interested in like trying hookah. So our, I, my roommate uh, smoked hookah and we started smoking hookah. And then from there I started drinking and drinking excessively. And very at that point, very promiscuous, sleeping around and just seeking for love, just seeking for identity in something. I realized that even through middle school, high school, and up to college, because I didn't have an identity, I was trying to be accepted in any crowd. And so I would be connected with people and I would do things that were out that was outside of my character, but I would do it because I wanted to fit in. But it still wasn't good enough. Like I realized that I would do all these things that everybody else is doing, the same exact thing, but it still wasn't good enough. I still wasn't cool enough. I still didn't fit in. I still was what they would say lame. All these things. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? Like why isn't why isn't it that I don't fit in with these people? I'm tr I'm doing exactly what they're doing but it never worked. And what I learned through that process of sleeping around and different things is like the love that I was seeking was definitely not in that because they would get what they want and keep moving. So I went through a lot of heartbreak during that time. And I remember uh, connecting with an old friend from middle school. And that was when we just started partying all the time. I remember drinking blackouts like we would I would black out nights of blacking out and everything and then I got into smoking weed and that was when I I smoked every single day it got to where I was just smoking socially and then once I because I didn't finish college I ended up moving in with a friend that I left um, that I met in middle school again we were partying every night and then once I moved in on my own I was smoking every night I couldn't be sober I just couldn't I became addicted to smoking weed during this time, I connected with a young man. At first, it was just a physical thing. It was just, you know, um, just us hooking up. And we would smoke a lot together and all of that. And then it eventually turned into a relationship. And the relationship was not healthy at all in any shape or form. Eventually, it became abusive. I remember my a friend of mine going through something like that. And I looked at her. I was like, I would never let a man put his hands on me. And then I get into this situation and never thought I would walk through something like this. In that moment, 
I would have people telling me, like, you need to get out of this relationship. You need to step away from this person. He's not good for you. But I felt like, okay, well, he loved me, though. And this is the best love that I can receive. And so I continued in this relationship for over a year and it just got progressively worse over time. In order to cope with everything that I was, we were going through, we would smoke all day. Um, I would wake up in the morning, smoke, go to work, come back home, smoke. Like that's all I did to, just to cope with everything that was going on in that time. I remember there was a time where we were arguing every single day, every day. Um, at this point we were living together and I, I reached out to him and I said, uh, I just want us to hang out without us arguing. He picks me up and we go to one of his friend's house. At that time, we immediately start arguing over what it was, I'm sure it was something small. We get to his friend's in like the basement area and we're smoking. And this is when my life like really changed. Um, because I'm sitting there, they were in the basement. I was in the living room area in the basement. They were in like the studio area. So I was by myself and I remember just sitting there and just thinking to myself, God, how did I get into this? Like, how did I go from this girl that was with my family and all this, this young girl who everyone says was so happy to this girl who's so broken and so shattered and so lost and so insecure. How did I end up here? And I remember asking God, like, Lord, or telling the Lord, I was like, I know I have to get out of this relationship, but I don't know how. Immediately in that moment, I hear God speak to me and he says, I have better for you. And I start crying and I'm sitting there in that basement and I'm just crying. And I tell him, I said, God, I can't do this by myself. And he says, I'll be there for you. And I was like, okay, that was, that was all I needed to hear when he said that to me. And so right after that, the guy that I was with walks in and wanted to talk to me and all these things. And there were so many things that happened that night that confirmed that God spoke to me. And so now, Teresa, up to this point, did you have a relationship with Jesus? Did you know it was the voice of God or what did it even sound like? Was this an audible voice? Was it internal? What was that like? Yeah. So I did not have a relationship with Jesus at all. I actually didn't even understand the concept of having a relationship with him. I didn't even know that God could speak to us. I had no idea. And so in that moment, it was so loud that it could have been audible. It's like this inward knowing that I had. The moment I heard his voice, I was like, that's God. Like the moment I heard it, it wasn't a question of like, what was that or anything? It was a, it was a knowing. It was a transformative voice, like something that hit me to where it completely transformed me. And that's how I knew it was the Lord. And I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it at all. But I definitely would say that it was loud enough for it to be audible. So I get to my house that night and I knew in my heart that we had to break up. And I ended up getting a text from him the next morning saying that we should break up. And I said, yeah, we should. And so from that moment on, I wish I could say that it was easy, you know, as far as separating from that person. But I will say that it was much easier than it would have been if I was doing it on my own. I had the grace of God on my life during that time. And he really helped me to separate from that person. So this was September of 2015. By October of 2015, we were completely disconnected from one another. And so, excuse me, September of 2015, I hear the voice of God and it completely transformed my life to the point where the desire to have sex left me. The desire, I used to curse really bad all of a sudden I just stopped cursing. All of these desires, like even as far as smoking weed. Now that was, I would say that was the hardest thing for me to let go. But there was a moment while walking with Christ where I just lost the desire to smoke weed. And so what I realized is that the Lord took me in my most messed up, dirty moment. And I didn't have to fix cursing or sex or anything like that. It was once he, once I said yes to him is when he started removing those desires over time. So Teresa, take us through, what was it like as you were walking with Christ, you began to lose all these desires that you had, but what were you gaining as you had begun your relationship with him? Yeah. So 
number one is gaining a desire and a heart for Christ and a love for Christ. It was just like this love that was developing within me that I just wanted to please him. Also, my identity. My identity, I didn't have one I or it was shattered. And once Christ called me out of this pit, that's when I started to see, wow, I'm a daughter. I'm a daughter of Christ. And my, I'm not who the mistakes that I've made. I'm not the decisions that I've made in the past or anything like that, but I'm a daughter of Christ. And so over time, through that time, I started to see myself through the lens of Christ and realize that these things that I was using to cope with, I no longer need because I have Christ and he's all that I need. Tell me about the Lord replacing your identity. What did he begin to tell you about yourself that maybe you didn't know before? <sighs> yeah. So that that was that was certainly a process in regards to him replacing my identity he number one of course called me his daughter and said that i'm fearfully and wonderfully made and that he knitted me in my my mother's womb and that he just began to instill his truths in me and use people to pour into me. My father and I's relationship definitely took a hit during the divorce. We weren't um, as close as I wanted us to be is because I'm going through what I'm going through. He's going through his process. With that, the Lord provided like surrogate fathers during that time to really pour into me and tell me how God sees me. And so after I started walking with the Lord, shortly after I ended up getting into um, ministry school, there were, you know, ministers pouring into me there, but specifically the Lord had me stay with an aunt and uncle for those two years that I was in ministry school and God used them and so many other people to really mold me and shape me and build me into this woman that he has called me to be. And I realized that it really does take a village. And I remember when I was in ministry school, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, and this is when I was going through some deep, deep healing and forgiveness concerning my dad and the whole process. And the Lord told me, he said, everything your earthly father couldn't give you, I will give to you and more. And that stood out to me because I said, Lord, it's not that he wouldn't. It's not that he just chose not to. It's because he physically couldn't. And so there were there were people that the Lord strategically placed in my life to compensate for the things that my father couldn't give me or my mother couldn't give me. That started my healing process. And I remember my uncle looking at me and saying, you're beautiful, you're this, you're that. And at first it was really hard for me to believe it. I would, I would listen to him. And at first it made me a little uncomfortable because I wasn't used to a man speaking into me like that in that way. But after a while, I began to believe it. I would say, wow, I am beautiful or wow, I am seen or why I am chosen and I'm not forgotten and I'm not forsaken. Any of those things, like I began to believe those things. I realized that that was a very important part of my life, um, those two years. But also through that time, the Lord really poured into me and just shaped me. And to even touch on the name situation, I remember when I was in ministry school and the, the minister was talking about, you know, when you start walking with Christ, sometimes the Lord gives you a new name, how Saul turned to Paul and just different people in the Bible, right? And the Lord kept encouraging me to change my name. My father, actually, my earthly father kept saying, Teresa, you need to change your name, Teresa, when I was in the world. And so I was just like, okay, whatever. I didn't really care because at that point I went by Brittany, but the Lord kept pressing on my heart. It's time to change your name. It's time to change your name. I was like, okay. And I remember sharing with my min the ministry school, my class. And I told them, I was like, well, I'm going to go by Teresa now. I'm not going to go by Brittany. And I explained to them my whole testimony and why. And my uncle said to me, he was like, you know, I knew Teresa would come around. Brittany went out and got buck wild, but I knew Teresa would come around. And it was funny, but it, st it stuck with me because when I was in the world and partying and doing all those things, everyone knew me as Brittany. But when the Lord called me out of that, the Lord said, no, you're, this is who I call you. Your name is Teresa. And so I went through that process. And by 2018, I graduated from um, ministry school. In 2019, my name was legally Teresa. 
it's just a series of events that took place to where God was just restoring my identity in Him. I started going by Teresa because that was my legal name and really understanding that, you know, that every time I say my name, it's a prophetic declaration of who God says I am. And so from there, God just began to continue to show me how He sees me. And so even in regards to as a, ch- as a child, I didn't really have like big dreams or anything like that at all. I, I just wanted to be a wife and a mother. That was my biggest dream as a child. That was like a clear slate for when I started walking with the Lord, He can start showing me the things that He's <clears throat> that He's called me to do on this earth. And so from there, as I began to walk with the Lord, there were so many things that the Lord was showing me and like just encouraging me to do, continuing to take me through healing, breaking things off of me, closing these wounds I didn't even know were there. I even went through a series of deliverance, extreme deliverance um, that I was walking through through. And so the Lord just continued in that time and continues to, excuse me, to just show me who he says I am and really just reveal to me all that he's called me to do on this earth. So my life is continuing to unfold before my eyes and our, the way my relationship with God is, is he says this and I say, okay. And he just leads me every step of the way. And so, yeah, that's been my journey. Wow. So, Teresa, what are some things that the Lord kind of was speaking to you about your future and who he's called you to be? Through this process, the Lord began to give me just like dreams and visions of me speaking on a, on stages with crowds. And in 2019, the Lord actually led me into bodybuilding and like different things like that, just things I enjoy. But also he's given me a heart for women women that have gone through the things that I've gone through and for children as well, you know, to really pour into children. Yeah, there have been so many things that God has revealed to me in regards to what he's called me to do. Even recently, I would say last year, the Lord revealed to me that he's calling me to praise dance ministry. So I started operating in that and I was just, so walking with God is like this big beautiful discovery. Like as you begin to continue walking with the Lord, it's like just things begin, you just begin to discover new things about yourself and just new things about God as well. Like through this process, I have grown to know God in ways that is just amazed me. Like I've known him, I've known him as my counselor, my friend, my father, my deliverer, my healer, you know, and that came from walking, walking with him and walking through processes and just experiencing things in life and understanding that I can rely on him and I can trust in him. If there's no one else that I can trust in, it's Jesus. So. Teresa, what words of encouragement do you have for those people who may be seeking for love, but just can't seem to find it? I would encourage the ones who are seeking for love and cannot find it to try Jesus. Because if you continue to seek love in the world, you're not going to find it. The love that you're looking for, the love that you so desire, that void that you're trying to fill with men, women, drugs, alcohol, whatever that may be, that the only thing that's going to fill that void or the only one that's going to fill that void is Jesus Christ. And I can say that because I have walked through it and I realized that I would be completely lost without him. And he was the one who put, picked me up out of the ditch that I built myself, I put myself in and cleaned me up. So I would encourage you even too that you don't have to try to clean yourself up before you say yes to Jesus. He just needs your yes and he will do the rest. Teresa, do you have any advice for those young people that may feel like they're too dirty or too damaged because of their sexual past to come mm. to Jesus? Wow, wow, wow. Yes, that, <laughs> that is a good question. When you say yes to Christ, when you receive Christ in your life, you are a new creation. The old has passed away. So the things that you have done, when Jesus sees you, he sees his blood. He doesn't see the sin that you've committed or sins that we've all committed, right? But he sees his blood because everything that we committed and everything we could ever commit, every sin we could ever commit, he took on the cross. And so... I would encourage that person that feels filthy, that feels dirty, that feels not even worthy. None of us are worthy of his love, but yet he gives it to us. Know that he loves you. He sees you. All he needs is just for you to say yes to him and he will do the rest. He will clean you up. And I, I'm a living testimony of that.
Teresa, what would you say to those people that are finding themselves in abusive relationships and they just don't see a way out? Do you have any advice for them or even encouragement for them? You're not alone. I know it may feel as though you're alone. I know it may feel as though you don't have a way out, but the, Jesus is the way out. I know you may feel as though you don't have the strength to walk away. He will give you the strength to walk away. I felt as though that was the only love I could possibly receive. I felt as though there was no way I could get out of this situation, that relationship. And the moment when I cried out to Jesus and just even silently said, Jesus, I, I can't do this anymore. That is when he stepped in and he pulled me out of it and he gave me the strength to keep walking. So for that person who feels as though there's no way out, there's always a way out. And Jesus is the way out. And all you have to do is say, Jesus, I need you. And he will come running. <laughs> what would you say to younger Teresa who was struggling with the insecurity, the divorce, the anger, the abuse? What would you have told her um, now from the place that you're at in Christ? To younger Teresa, you've walked through a lot and you've been through many things. But one thing that has remained is Jesus in your life. And he has been faithful to you. And the, the things that you thought would break you and destroy you. God turned it around for your good. And in the moments where you felt like you weren't good enough and you felt as though no one could love you, you have experienced the greatest love that you could ever experience. And that is the love of Jesus Christ. There's no love greater than that. And you have developed such a beautiful relationship with Christ and with the enemy meant to destroy you, man, God turned it around for your good and continues to turn it around for your good. So, wow. Teresa, who is Jesus to you? Wow. Jesus is everything. Jesus is my Savior. He is my Father. He is my Redeemer. He is my healer, my counselor, my friend. He is everything that I could possibly need on this earth and into eternity. <laughs> Teresa, do you have any last words for the people watching who may be connecting with your story? For anyone watching this who feels as though you're lost and that God can never love you or choose you, or you feel as though even life may not be worth living, know that if you're breathing, you're here for a purpose. Know that you are loved, that you are seen, that you are chosen, and that God wants nothing more than to have a relationship with you. God wants nothing more than for him to reveal all the beautiful things that he has placed inside of you, that you are not too far gone, you are not too lost, you are not too dirty for him to clean you up. There is a purpose for you on this earth. If you woke up this morning, there is a purpose for you. And the way you will discover that purpose is by having a relationship with the one who gave you that purpose, your creator. Teresa, we would love it if you could just pray for the people watching your testimony right now. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you today, oh God. We thank you, Jesus, for who you are, God. We thank you, Jesus, for your love and your goodness and your faithfulness and your mercy, oh God. We thank you. I thank you, oh Lord, for every person watching this right now, Father God. I thank you, Jesus, for the souls that are listening to this, Lord, for the hearts that are broken, Father. I thank you, Jesus, for meeting every person where they where they are, oh God, for stepping in and healing every wound, Jesus. May they encounter you right now in this moment, oh God. May they experience your love and your peace that surpasses understanding, regardless of what they're walking through right now, oh God. I pray, Lord, that you would remind them that you are with them, that you will never leave them nor forsake them, oh God. And may they say yes. Yes to you, Jesus. May they cry out to you, God. And I thank you, Jesus, for hearing their prayers, for hearing everything that they've spoken to you, God. 
And I just thank you for encounters, for souls to be one for your kingdom, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.